Okay, we are recording our third 110 acoustics session for this course. And what we want to do here is we want to finish off unit one, wavelength, frequency, speed of sound. Next week, we'll go into unit two, which is the decibel. So we're finishing off this week's this, the, the notes for unit one. I will share screen and pull those guys up. So that one, shrink this one, here you go. So looking at the notes and where we were, okay, I will kind of go where we finished off last time. We finished off last time talking about wavelength and frequency, and we talked about, wave, about uh, frequency and period. So now we're moving on to page three, and we'll finish page, pages three and four today. Here's some stuff I'll have you uh, put a star by, that some stuff is important and some stuff isn't. So speed of sound, the velocity of sound. Basically, you should have a grip on this one. Don't worry about the 343 if you just think 340, close enough. 340 meters per second is the speed of sound. About 1130 feet per second. Or, if you're sticking into metric, it's 1238 kilometers an hour. And if you're going in terms of miles, the speed of sound is 766 miles an hour. Now, when you think about that, what is that really? Well, it's a little bit faster than a jet. When you're taking an airline and you're flying from Kansas City to St. Louis, and the plane leaves the ground and you're flying through the air and you're about halfway there, you are going about 550 miles an hour, about 600 miles an hour max. Minimum 500, maximum 600. So you're slightly under the speed of sound. Okay? Only wasn't all that long ago when finally jets were able to break the sound barrier. But most commercial jets that you, people fly in don't break the sound barrier. Now look at the speed of light that I'm highlighting here. Light travels, now look at how many zeros are here. <laughs> A hundred million times faster than sound. A million, a hundred million times faster than sound does. That's why when you hear, when you have a thunderstorm, you see the lightning way before you hear the thunder, okay? Sound travels slower. So the speed of light was about almost 300 million kilometers per second, okay? 300, so that's pretty fast. Sound in air travels about 331 meters per second. Okay, so sound is pretty, sound travels a lot slower. You don't need to know this. What I'm graying out here, please don't think you have to memorize that. What you should know is this. Okay, the top one. So the speed of sound is about four times faster through water. So you know that dolphins and whales communicate with sounds through water. Sound travels through water too, but it travels faster than it does through air. It's about four times the speed of, of sound in air. And look at this. In steel, sound travels 14 times faster than it does in air. And that's where people got that old saying, you know, I'm looking for a job and someone says, oh, I'll keep my ear to the ground. When you're putting your ear to the ground, <laughs> Okay, you're putting your ear to, 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 some, to solid. And that sound travels faster through solids. That's why people would listen to a train and put their ear on the railroad track. You'll hear the sound quicker through the railroad track than you will through the air. Native Indians would put their ear to the ground to listen for the buffalo. Okay, you can hear the sound quicker through the ground because it's solid. So sound travels in air, but in water, four times faster, and in steel or solids, 14 times faster. So it's, it's amazing. So just something to keep in mind. Now here's something you need to put an asterisk by. This is a bit of physics, okay? Here you go. Speed of sound depends on the density, which is like the mass, and the elasticity, which is like the stiffness. Remember we talked about mass and stiffness. 
Mass resonates with low frequencies. Stiffness resonates with highs. Now look at those two words, density, and then I put in parentheses mass, and then you'll see elasticity in italics, and then I put in parentheses stiffness. They are the same thing, okay? Density is the same as mass. Elasticity is the same thing as stiffness. Now when you think of the word elasticity, please don't think of elastic bands. Okay, elastic bands are rubber and they're okay. Elasticity means exactly the opposite. It's the stiffness, how stiff an object is. So the mass of an object and the stiffness of an object, those two things determine what, what the resonance will be. And they also determine the speed of sound through which the sound travels. So how fast will sound travel through metal? How fast will sound travel through air? It depends on the density of air and the stiffness of air and the density of metal and the stiffness of metal. Don't worry about this word here, inversely related to the blah, 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 square root of intensity, blah, 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 blah. Don't worry about that, okay? Put an asterisk here. As air temperature increases, the speed of sound increases a little bit, okay? So if it's really hot out, sound travels a slight bit faster than it does through freezing cold winter air, okay? Enough on that. Basically, to the top of the page, what's the speed of sound? 340 meters per second or 1130 feet per second. And the speed of light is way faster than it is in air. All right. Okay, now look at here. You'll say, huh, okay. Hmm. 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 As fluids and metals are more dense, the denser an object is, the slower the sound will go. Okay? The stiffer an object is, the faster sound will go through it. So put that down. Keep that in your head. Write it down on top of that line in here. Okay. The more dense something is, the slower sound will go through it. The more stiff something is, the faster sound will go through it. So now this sentence here is asking you, yeah, but if fluids and metals certainly are more dense than air, aren't they? I mean, watch. I mean, if I can, if I, I can move my hand through air, but I can't move my hand through my face, <laughs> this, is, this is more dense. Yeah, I know I'm pretty dense, okay? But this is more dense than air. It's harder than air, right? And water in a cup, okay, is harder than air. So they're more dense. So, but what did we just say in that sentence there? We said, oh, as things are more dense, sound goes slower through it. And things are more stiff, sound goes faster through it. And that's why I, I'm highlighting this sentence. But fluids and metals are more dense than air. So why does sound go faster through them if they are more dense? Okay, steel is 6,000 times more dense than air. The sound speed is inverse to density. The more dense something is, the slower sound goes. But here you go. Steel is way more elastic than air. In other words, circle that word, stiff. It's more stiff than air. Think of elasticity as the ability to resist being deformed, just like I'm highlighting right there on your screen. Okay, so the elasticity of steel is a million two hundred and thirty times more than the stiffness of air. The elasticity of steel outweighs the elasticity of air. So even though, so this paragraph here is, is one I need you to highlight, okay, even though air, I should say water and steel are more dense than air, and more dense co density causes a slowness in the speed of sound. Even though that's true, the stiffness of steel outweighs its greater density. The fact that steel is way more stiff than air, okay, causes the sound to go faster through it. So the, the greater elasticity of metal is outweighs its greater density.
Steel is 6,000 times more dense than air, but the elasticity or stiffness of steel is 1,230,000 times that of air. Therefore, the greater elasticity of steel far outweighs its greater density. That is why the speed of sound is faster through steel than it is through air. Now, in any medium, air, water, etc., wavelength, speed of sound, and frequency are all interrelated. Speed of sound, and I'm going to ask you to put an asterisk here too, has no relation to frequency. In other words, in air, all frequencies travel the same. In water, all frequencies travel equally quickly. In steel, all frequencies travel equally quickly. No frequencies travel faster than other frequencies. In any one particular medium through which sound travels, all frequencies travel the same. Why am I repeating that? Because every year I have that as a true-false question, and every year some students get it wrong. <laughs> That's why. I'll have a true-false question saying, a thousand hertz travels way faster than two thousand hertz. True or false? And a lot of people put true, and it's like, no, <laughs> all frequencies travel the same speed in any particular medium. Now we're going to talk about the Doppler effect. Sp speaking of speed of sound, the Doppler effect is something that happens below the speed, the, below the sound barrier. Okay, below the speed of sound. So you're talking, it, it occurs for, in air, it occurs for sound waves, it occurs at, for, for things going less than 766 miles an hour. So here goes, the Doppler effect. You're standing at the street corner, okay, and you hear an ambulance coming toward you, or a police car. And the police car is going, has a siren going, ee! And as the car's coming toward you, the siren goes up in pitch. And once the car goes past you, think of a race car. As it comes toward you, the frequency goes up. As it leaves you, the frequency goes down. Why is that? Read it with me. Frequency increases as the object approaches, then decreases as it passes. Some stationary source of, say, 100 hertz is going to vibrate air molecules, okay, at about 340 meters per second toward you. As the source moves toward you, the distance is decreased and it crowds the same number of cycles into a smaller distance. Look, you've got the speed of sound happening, and sound is traveling like this toward you, okay? But the car is also coming toward you. So you've got the speed of sound, 766 miles an hour, plus the speed of the car. So if the car is going 60 miles an hour, and the speed of sound is 766 miles an hour, you've just increased that speed, the, the, the speed of sound toward you, okay? Because the car is moving toward you. So you've got the car speed plus the speed of sound coming to your ears. That's going to crowd the sound waves together. It's going to push the waves together. They're going to get squeezed. And what happens when you get shorter wavelengths? You get higher frequency. Now the car passes you. So now you've got the speed of sound minus the speed of the car, because it's now leaving you. So the speed of sound is still coming from the tail end of the car, but the car is going away from you. So now you've got longer wavelengths. And what happens with longer wavelengths? Lower frequency. So the Doppler effect is something that occurs below the speed of sound. It's, an, uh, it's a phenomenon that occurs below Mach 1. M-A-C-H. Mach 1 is the speed of sound. Okay? M-A-C-H 1. Mach 1, speed of sound. So read this next one here. Sonic boom. 
Okay, now you're breaking the sound barrier. The sonic boom, that's something that occurs above the speed of sound. So Mach 1 is the speed of sound in air. Mach 2 is twice the speed of sound. Now, what is a sonic boom? A sonic boom, watch, read with this. As the airplane approaches you at Mach 1, you hear the Doppler effect, okay? Frequency increases. As the speed of the plane approaches the speed of sound, the waves really bunch up. Think about this. You've got the waves coming at you at 766 miles an hour or 1,238 kilometers an hour, but now the plane is also going that speed. The plane is also going 766 miles an hour. So it's caught up with the speed of sound. And what's happening is it squishes all the waves. Here's the sound going. And now the plane is, is meeting that. The, the, the sound is moving toward you. Here's the waves. But the plane is also moving toward you. And it's moving at the same speed as the sound. So it squishes all the waves together, it squeezes them together. So yep, you get a higher frequency, but suddenly the sound, the plane is able to pierce the sound barrier, because now it's going faster than the speed of sound. And you know what's happened? You've got a great big compression of all these waves built up together into a ball. They're all built up, and you've got a big vacuum of sound waves behind the plane, a big back, a rarefaction. So you got a big compression of waves and you got a big rarefaction of waves behind the plane. And as soon as the plane punctures through that compressed bunch of sound waves, those sound waves rush and fill in the rarefacted vacuum behind it. And that's the sonic boom. boom. So watch what happens here. We'll just look at our screen and take a peek at our PowerPoint. And just to give you an idea, just for fun, if we go to the PowerPoint here, here's a picture of the plane piercing the sound barrier, okay? You've, you, you, it's caught up to the speed of sound. It's just like the Doppler effect, we said. And you can see the Doppler effect described here, and this is kind of a, a complicated way of describing it, but let's, be, let's, let's read the Doppler effect and then the speed of sound, uh, the sonic boom again, just for fun. Doppler's principle, point A, now I, point A is on the left here, okay, is the location of a moving source of sound. P point C is you standing on the corner, okay? Distance, S, okay? The point C is the location of a person, distance S is the speed of sound, and distance SS is the speed of the moving source. So here's the speed of sound, and here's the moving source. If the source were stationary, after one second, the compression and rarefactions would be spread over the distance of A to C. But the source is moving. And after one second, it's located now at B. The same number of compressions and rarefactions will now be crowded into distances B and C. The wavelength, the distance of one compression to another must therefore be decreased because the wavelengths are now crowded and the frequency with which the wave fronts move by the receiver C must be increased because the wavelengths have decreased. The Doppler effect is something that happens below the speed of sound. Breaking the sound barrier, of course, is above the speed of sound. And once again, the plane. The sound is moving toward you, and the plane is moving at the same speed. So it squeezes all the sound waves together. You have a Doppler effect. The, the waves are getting shorter. But now it's going faster than the speed of sound. And now the crowded bunch of waves fills in the rarefacted area behind the plane, and that's the sonic boom. If you want to hear about it in more gentle or more uh, regular terms, the snap of a towel in a locker room. And we said this last week. Someone curls up a towel like this and snaps the towel at you. It stings like crazy. You know why? Because the is the tip of the towel breaking the sound barrier. You've got a wee little sonic boom. The, the, the crack of a whip, 
that that the end of the whip is has going has broken the sound barrier. You've just made a wee little sonic boom. Okay, enough on that. Let's talk about the next topic in terms of sound and the speed of sound and go into sound fields. So remember, wavelength, frequency, speed of sound, there's a whole connection to them. And we covered that last week at the bottom of page two. But now we're at nearing the bottom of page three, sound fields. Sound field has nothing to do with a farmer with corn or growing wheat, okay? A sound field is simply an area in which sound takes place. It's just an area in which sound takes place. Could be a canyon, could be your living room, could be your kitchen. That's a sound field, okay? So a free field would be sound in a space where there are no reverberations or echoes. Hmm. A free field means there's no walls, no floor, no ceiling. The sound just exists in a great big area. Now read what it says in the next sentence. That hardly exists in reality. I mean, everywhere sound occurs, there's got to be something to bounce off. Okay, so a free field barely exists. Okay, a free field might be way up in the sky, like about a a thousand feet above the ground and you made a sound so it's got nowhere to bounce off of it's just going out like spheres okay but most sound fields have hard surfaces that sound is bouncing off of. now a reflection occurs when sound bounces off of a wall or in physics we say a reflection occurs when sound travels from one medium to another so if sounds traveling through the air and it hits your cupboard well that's another medium Okay, air is one medium, your cupboard is another medium. Where sound travels through air and hits the, wall, the back wall of a classroom. Okay, sound traveling through air is one medium, the back wall of a classroom is another medium. All right, so sound energy in the first medium, air, increases because of the added reflected sound off of the second medium. Right, just like a room full of mirrors. If you have a room full of mirrors, it's going to get brighter because the light's all reflecting off of the mirrors. Okay, the same thing is gonna happen with sound. If it's reflecting and bouncing off of walls in a small area, the sound's gonna increase. Well, reflection, let's talk about sound reflection. There's two kinds, reverberation and echo. Reverberation and echo. So read this here, reflection occurs when sound travels from one medium to another. In other words, from it's traveling through air and it hits the back wall of a classroom. Sound energy in the first medium will increase because of the added reflected sound off of the back wall of the classroom. Like a mirror increases light from a lamp. For example, an actor in an enclosed theater is going to be louder than an, act, than, than, than an actor in a big open space. Think about it. Look, you're standing on a football field. You're standing in the middle of a football field and you're yelling. Ah! Okay, what happens if you stand inside of a telephone booth and yell? Okay, the telephone booth is way smaller than the open football field. The sound is going to be louder because it's going to be bouncing off the glass walls of the telephone booth. And this has a lot to do with hearing aids, okay? Because hearing aids, the sound is coming out in a tiny little ear canal. And your ear canal is way smaller than your room, okay? So the smaller your ear canal, the greater the sound pressure level. These things are all going to be affected. So the size of a room and the closeness of the walls is going to affect the loudness of the sound. Now, there's two kinds of reflection. One's an echo and one's a reverberation. An echo is like you'd have at Grand Canyon. Hello, 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 hello. You've all experienced echoes. You yell on the downtown and it'll bounce off of the bank, you know, about a block away. Hello, hello. All right. An echo is when the reflected sound occurs at greater than 0.1 second. 
if the reflection takes more than a tenth of a second, it's called an echo. All right. So if the if the if the hard wall is far enough away, okay, the reflected sound will take a tenth of a second to reach your ear. That's an echo. Hello, hello. What's a reverberation? A reverberation is different. A reverberation is when the reflected sound is happens at less than a tenth of a second. Less than a tenth of a second. Now, where do you get reverb? You get reverb in classrooms. You get reverberation in gymnasiums. Think of a basketball. Bah, 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 bah. You, or some singer in a, in a, in a hard wall gymnasium. Be -ba -ba -ya, be -ma -ba -ba. You can hear that. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's reverberation. The reflected sound is occurring at less than a tenth of a second. An echo, the reflected sound is occurring to your ear at greater than a tenth of a second. A, a reverberation is just a super short echo. Good. Look what it says in the last sentence here. It wreaks havoc with hearing aids on kids in classrooms. Reverberation is not a good thing for hearing aid wearers. So in classrooms where there are hearing impaired children, or even in restaurants when you want to hear people better, you want to get rid of the reverberation. And that's why restaurants often have carpets on the wall to help absorb sound so it's not reflected. So you don't get that hard walled clatter. And that's why kitchens with hard walls are not great places for nursing homes with, with elderly people because of the clatter of the cutlery and the talking. You're getting so much reverberation that it's hard to hear. It's much better to hear in a room that's got soft walls, okay? Because then you're getting rid of the reverberation and it's way easier to hear. Now, what happens in a sound treated room when people are getting a hearing test and they've got headphones on the ear and you're asked to raise a, raise a finger every time you hear a tone and the tones are made softer and softer and softer. You're going to be doing this next year, next semester in this course. It's called audiometry, okay? And when you're testing someone's hearing, you've got headphones on and you're reducing the intensity of the sound until the person can't hear it anymore, okay? And what kind of a room is that person sitting in? That person is sitting in a sound-treated room. It's kind of like a room that's got walls that block out sound from coming in, but it's not totally soundproof, okay? It's kind of what sound-resistant. It's the walls are thick enough to block out sound so that a normal hearing person can hear all the way down to zero decibels. Okay, that's a sound treated room. And that's what you're going to be seeing in audiometry, sound treated rooms. They're a little bit bigger than a telephone booth. You know, they're maybe four feet by four feet, whatever. There's different sizes of them. They're usually colored white. I don't know why kind of to be clinical, I guess. But at any rate, that's, those are the kind of rooms that you'll be testing people in, all right, when you start doing clinical audiometry. But what's a soundproof room? A soundproof room is called anechoic. An means without, just like anaerobic means without oxygen, okay? Anechoic, A-N-E-C-H-O-I-C, and echoic means non echoic. There's no echo, there's no reverberation at all. And when you have that, you have a sound proof room. All the sound you're saying is absorbed into the wall. Everything. So you're talking, okay, but it's so muffled. I mean, you can hear, but sound proof rooms are so quiet that you will end up hearing your lunch digesting. You're gonna hear the gurgle in your stomach. You're gonna hear a ringing in your ear. You're gonna hear sounds because it's dead quiet. 
anechoic rooms are used in research. Anechoic rooms have great big sponges sticking out of the walls. The sponges might be two to three feet long. They look like big points, like big cones sticking out at you. And those are called anechoic rooms. They are meant to be sound proof. They have no echo, no reverberation whatsoever. But when you're testing people's hearing, the walls, you're going to see tiny little holes in the walls with, with kind of um, drywall behind, a bit of kind of spongy material behind as well. They're meant to reduce a lot of reverberation and echo too, but not 100%, not totally. Anyway, the walls of an anechoic room are completely thick as well, so that you can yell all you want and nobody outside is going to hear you. And people outside can yell all they want and nobody's going to hear them. So, but the, so let's go to our notes here and read what we've got on the top of page four. So here we go. We were on page three. Here's page four. A standing wave is when a sound bounces back off of a wall and it's in complete opposite phase with the original sound that hit the wall. Hmm. So it cancels itself out. What did we read about phase? Let's go to look at that in our gold. Here you go. Look at the bottom sound here. Two sounds are out of phase. Here's one sound. Here's the other one. When they're in opposite phase, you'll have the sound of one hand clapping. You will have silence. Okay? So, in a room, when the original sound is coming out of the wall, or is, is, coming, is coming from a source, okay? I don't want this picture. I want uh, notes. Okay. When, when, it's, when an original sound occurs and it bounces and then the sound bounces back off of a wall if the sound bouncing back off the wall is in complete opposite phase with the original sound that hit the wall you're going to get a cancellation and you're going to get a dead spot in the room so you're going to get a lousy quality of sound and this is why people engineer rooms that's why acoustic engineers design theaters Theaters aren't just made like out of just for fun. They're designed so that you don't have dead spots in the room. You don't want to have areas in the room where the sound bouncing off the wall is opposite in phase to the original sound that hit the wall. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting in a lousy place. You're going to be hearing, you know, a crummy sound. You're going to have to move to a different seat. That's because the seat you had was in a dead spot area. Acoustic engineers deliberately design rooms so that they don't have dead spots. All right. An anechoic room. There you go. And means without. Echoic means has echoes. It's an anechoic room is meant to imitate a free field. They are extremely expensive. What did we say was a free field? No sound bouncing back. When you've got a soundproof room, you have an anechoic room. It has no reverberation whatsoever, and the walls are very, very thick. Sound-treated rooms are what you and I will use in our field. Hearing is tested in a semi-soundproof room, usually isolated from the rest of the building by double glass, double walls, etc. Ambient room noise is kept down to a minimum and it, it enables hearing testing to be, down, to, be, to, to be done down to a minimum with faint tones. All right, there's that topic covered. Now we move to the next one. This topic you will run into again and again. We will cover it again in another couple of weeks, but let's scratch the surface of it here and now. Impedance equals resistance plus opposition. Those three words, put a star by this and memorize what the words are, okay? <clears throat> any object through which sound will travel, any object will offer some resistance and some opposition to the passage of sound, okay? Because even air, sound isn't gonna go forever. I can yell all I want here in Vancouver, BC, but you're not going to hear me in Springfield, Missouri. Okay? The sound is going to peter out. It's going to die out. It's going to run into opposition and resistance in the air. 
and eventually it's going to die out. Okay, impedance is that opposition and resistance to the passage of sound. And there are three things in impedance. Impedance, just think of it as the opposition to the passage of sound. When you think of impedance, think of a bouncer not letting certain people come in the bar. Okay, you are impeded. You're not allowed to get through. So impedance is the opposition to the passage of sound. So let's look at it in our notes and break it down into its pieces. Any object offers resistance and opposition to the passage of sound. Together, this is called impedance. Sound gets softer as it moves through an elastic medium. Air, water, metal, all of these impede the passage of sound. Sound bounces through air, or sound in traveling through air bounces off of water because water offers more impedance than air. Think about it. You're jumping off a cliff and you decide to do a belly flop. Is that going to hurt? Yeah, because <laughs> you're going through air and suddenly you've hit another medium. And that medium is more dense than the air, and it's going to hurt. Okay, so sound traveling through air is going to bounce off the water. And guess what? In anatomy, which we're going to cover later on today, we're going to be talking about the middle ear. And the middle ear, the purpose of it is to overcome that impedance mismatch because the inner ear is filled with fluid. Think about them. The inner ear is filled with fluid. Airborne sound is traveling through the air. So airborne sound would bounce right off of the middle, uh, off of the inner ear because the inner ear or cochlea is filled with fluid. And that's why you have a middle ear. Back to acoustics though, because we'll talk about that when we talk about anatomy. Right here, it says, sound through air bounces off water because water offers more impedance than air. Okay, it's a different medium. Resistance. Circle the word resistance. Resistance, think about it like friction. And in electricity, the word is ohms. O-H-M-S. -O ohms is a unit of resistance. Resistance to the passage of sound, it, it, okay, is independent of frequency. Put a star by that, okay? So resistance in any object to the passage of sound, okay, sound going through this cup, sound going through my pen, sound going through anything, okay, the impedance or, or the resistance to the passage of sound, any object is going to offer some resistance to the passage of sound, okay, and that resistance is going to be like friction. And that resistance is going to be equal for all frequencies. So in a railroad track or in a body of water or in some space of air, the resistance to the passage of sound will be equal for all frequencies. Okay, you have that. Now let's look at opposition. Opposition to the passage of sound in any object is sometimes called reactance, okay? Opposition to the sound is due to the mass and stiffness of the object. Opposition, so what does it say at the very top here in bold? Impedance equals resistance plus opposition. Well, we've covered resistance. Resistance is like friction. It's going to be equal for all frequencies in any object. Okay, you have that one. Opposition now is sometimes called reactance. And opposition to sound is due to the mass and stiffness of, uh, in that object. Vibrations in any object are thus affected by the mass and stiffness of the object. Mass is like the amount of matter present. It's like the density. Mass is like correlated with weight. 
okay? Stiffness, we said earlier, is like, it's not like elastic bands, okay? Stiffness is called, in physics, it's called elasticity. And it's defined as its resistance to being bent. It's resistance to distortion. It's the opposite of compliance. Stiffness. Stiff, not compliance. Think of a bouncer. A bouncer who's really compliant goes, eh, okay, go on in. A bouncer who's mentally very stiff is going, you can't come in. Okay? Stiffness is the opposite of compliance. And stiffness is can be drawn, I think, if I've got it in my PowerPoint. And I hope I do. Not sure if I do, but I might. I'll just take a look here. If I don't, it isn't the end of the world. Oh, no, I don't have it here, but that doesn't matter. Let me just describe it to you. Okay? Mass. Think of a locomotive, a train, a great big train. Now, a big locomotive has a lot of mass, doesn't it? It's heavy as hell. Are you going to be able to jiggle a locomotive? Like, da -da 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 -da. no. It's going to take 100 people to push, and then 100 people to pull, and then 100 people to push, because it's got a lot of mass. It's got a lot of density. Now think about stiffness. Think of a stiff spring sticking out of the wall. Maybe I can even stand up here and pretend. Think of it. See this wall over here? Think of it as a big, thick spring sticking out of the wall. If I try to push on this on that stiff spring slowly and pull slowly i'm going to run into a lot of opposition but if i stand here and go yeah, 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 no problem okay stiffness likes to be moved fast mass hates to be moved fast so mass resonates with low frequencies and stiffness resonates with high frequencies. And that's why I've put these two pieces together in the notes. And we'll go to the notes. Okay? There you go. We'll go right to it. Impedance is connected with resonance. Okay? All of that stuff. So mass opposes highs and it resonates with low frequencies, okay? Stiffness opposes low frequencies, doesn't like them, and it resonates with high frequencies. So impedance is like the flip side of resistance. A frown is an upside down smile, okay? If mass opposes high frequencies, mass resonates, favors low frequencies. And stiffness opposes low frequencies, and stiffness resonates with high frequencies. Get it? Got it? Good. So this impedance section here is all connected with resonance that's described near the bottom of the page. All right? <clears throat> so vibrations in any object are affected by mass and stiffness. Mass is the amount of matter, the density. Stiffness is the opposite of compliance, okay? So in any particular object, the opposition is very different for different frequencies of sound. For, that is, changing the frequency of the sound definitely will change the amount of opposition. If the object has a lot of mass, it's going to oppose high frequencies. It's not going to let high frequencies get through it. If, if an object is very stiff, it's going to oppose low frequencies. It's not going to let uh, stiff low frequencies get through it. So, flip side, mass is going to really like low frequencies going through it, and stiffness is going to really like high frequencies going through it. So, <clears throat> opposition or reactance is very, very frequency dependent because it's, it, it, it hinges on mass and stiffness, and mass opposes highs, and stiffness opposes lows. But resistance in any object is not frequency dependent. It's like friction. 
So opposition due to, to the mass and stiffness can be seen as one hammer, and the other one is resistance, and those two together are impedance. Okay, now take that big frown called impedance, flip it upside down to a smile called resonance. Impedance is the opposite of resonance. An object's favorite vibrating frequencies is where the least impedance is. If an object offers impedance to a certain sound, it does not resonate with that sound. Resonance occurs in any transmission system, anything through which sound travels, when the opposition due to mass is equal to the opposition due to stiffness. This is in your textbook as well. And you, I suggest you have a read of it, but in your textbook, if you see this picture, you will see it right there. Okay? Resonant frequency is where the impedance or the opposition due to mass is equal to the opposition due to stiffness. At that particular frequency will be the resonance of an object. Lass and Woodford, figure 116 out of your textbook. So, any object thus has a favorite vibrating frequency. Think of a wine glass at Christmas, and I've demonstrated this one before. Lick your finger, you hit the resonant frequency of the wine glass. Blow over a pop bottle, and all of a sudden, okay, you finally hit the resonant frequency of that pop bottle. The frequency where the opposition due to its mass and opposition due to its stiffness are equal. Resonance is the favorite vibrating frequency of an object. And it hinges directly on the mass and stiffness properties of that object. Slain and pimple. Plain and simple. Ah, all right. We be winding down. Now. Here we near the end of unit one. I'm going to scroll down here. Tuning forks. I just read this. Here you go. Let's read it. As mass increases, resonant frequency decreases. Thicker strings on musical instruments vibrate more slowly. A, for example, a floor has lots of mass. Only the bass is heard from the neighbor's apartment upstairs, right? Just think about it. You're sitting in your living room. Neighbors upstairs are playing loud music. What's coming through the ceiling? The bass and the drums. Because your ceiling is dominated by mass. So it's going to resonate with low frequencies. That's what's coming through. Stiffness, as stiffness increases, resonant frequency increases. Hold out your arm straight and stiff. It's easier to move it up and down rapidly. Now, I'm going to show you here and pretend I'm going to hold my arm out really stiff. And if, and I'm going to read your name here, if Anna Woods or if Ricky Trowbridge, either one of you, was to grab my finger, my fingers, if I held my arm out really stiff and you grab the end of my fingertips and you try to lift it up and push it down and lift it up and push it down, you'd run into a lot of opposition. But if I'm holding my arm out really stiff and you did this, no problem. Okay? I can hold up my arm as stiff as I want. If one of you grabbed the, the, my fingertips and jiggled, I wouldn't be able to oppose it. I, uh, I'd move right with it. Stiffness resonates with high frequencies. Mass resonates with low frequencies. Stiffness opposes Low frequencies resonates with highs. Mass opposes high frequencies, resonates with lows. Okay? So think of impedance and resistance as a frown and an upside down smile. They are inversely related. Good. I think we're getting through. I'm going to finish here with this. And you had some of this when we covered the outer ear in anatomy. And now we're going to look at it again, okay? Carefully. Put a star by this one. I think this is part of the hardest, this, this third week is the hardest part of wavelength 
frequency and speed of sound. But we will enc encounter this again and again. So please don't think that I'm going to always get harder and more and more because it's not true. We're going to repeat a lot of things. You're hearing some of this for the first or second time. I think we covered some of this in the outer ear. But let's look at it again here in, a, in, a, in the acoustics course, 110. There's something called quarter wave resonators. So put a star by this one. Quarter wave resonators are mentioned very often in our field, a lot. Okay? Quarter wave resonators are things like cylinders, like my cup. I'm not going to tip it too much or the coffee's going to fall out. Okay? But the cup has an open top and a closed bottom. Anything that's like a cylinder that's closed at one end and open at the other end is a quarter wave resonator. Now, I can think of two examples in our field of quarter wave resonators. One of them is your ear canal. Your ear canal is a thin tube, it's open at one end, and it's closed by the eardrum at the other end. So it's a quarter wave resonator. I can think of another quarter wave resonator too, your throat. Your mouth is open, and your vocal folds, your larynx, your Adam's apple is here. This is what creates your speech. So this is closed, your mouth is open, and it's a tube. So it, too, is a quarter wave resonator. Speech has one, hearing has one. Now, let's look at quarter wave resonators. What is it about quarter wave resonators that's unique? A tube closed at one end, resonates best, now you know what resonance is, favorite vibrating frequency, a tube closed at one end resonates best when it's a quarter the length of the sound wave. Okay, in other words, in English, sound waves that are four times as long as the tube are going to resonate that tube. Okay, quarter wave resonators. Any tube closed at one end, it says here, resonates best when it's a quarter the length of the sound wave in question. In other words, sound waves four times as long as the tube are going to resonate the tube. All right. Two examples would be your outer ear canal and your vocal tract, the tube from your throat out to your mouth. Okay. Outer ear canal. How long is it? Now, I'm going to say this in plain metric, because let's forget the inches right now, although if you worked out the inches, it would work the same. What did we say your ear canal is in length? It's an inch. It's about an inch long. What's an inch? Two and a half centimeters. What's a centimeter? Your fingernail. So put two and a half, two of these, about two and a half of these together, and you got an inch. Okay? Just think in broad terms. So two and a half centimeters is one inch. Okay, now back to your notes. The speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second, or 340 meters per second. So what's it going to resonate best with? Your ear canal is going to resonate best with sound waves that are four times its length. Well, what's four times two and a half? Ten centimeters, or 0.1 meter. Right there. Okay. Now recall from two pages, from page two of your notes, the formulas for wavelength, frequency, and speed of sound. Frequency equals speed of sound divided by the wavelength. Look at this. Remember, I'm going to take you right up there because that's where you saw them. Right here. Okay. Wavelength equals speed of sound over frequency. Frequency equals speed of sound over wavelength. Speed of sound equals frequency times wavelength. And just to look at an example, 5 is equal to 10 divided by 2. 2 is equal to 10 divided by 5. 10 is equal to 2 times 5. Okay, so keep it straight, keep it simple. When we were looking at wavelength, versus frequency, we were trying to figure out the physical length of the wave. So we said wavelength equals speed of sound over the frequency. 
And we could do it in feet too. Wavelength over one equals 1130 feet per second divided by 100 hertz. And we found out that that was 11.3 feet. Or in metric, the wavelength of a 100 hertz tone, 343 divided by 100 is 3.3 meters. 3.3 meters or 3.43 meters is 11.3 feet. So it doesn't matter how you figure it, okay? But here, we're not trying to find the wavelength anymore. We're trying to find the frequency. So we just flip that formula around a little bit. Here we go. Where is that guy? We're interested in this one, okay? So we're looking at that one. All right, so let's move down to the end to right where we were. Okay, recall from page two of your notes the formulas for wavelength, frequency, and speed of sound. Frequency equals the speed of sound divided by the wavelength. So frequency over one equals 343 speed of sound divided by 0.1 meter. Okay, there you have it. So, because 10 centimeters is a tenth of a meter, is 0.1 meter. And why 10 centimeters? Because your ear canal is two and a half centimeters long, so it's going to vibrate or resonate with sounds that are four times that. Four times two and a half is 10 centimeters. What's 10 centimeters in, met in, in, in a meter? It's 0.1 meter. Because if we're talking 343 meters per second, we've got to have the denominator also in, in meters. We can't be talking apples and oranges, okay? So 343 divided by 0.1 is 3,000. 400 hertz. And that would be the natural resonance of your outer ear canal because it's a quarter wave resonator. Now let's talk about how come when you breathe helium out of a balloon. Now have you ever breathed in helium? Have you ever taken a helium balloon? Oh, you got to try it sometime. It's a hoot. I do it all the time. When I'm at carnivals or fairs and you see a, the balloon sitting up like that, I always grab one, snap the string, try to undo the knot. That's the hardest part, undoing the knot. But once you got that, hold the balloon and... And you'll be talking like this. Your whole voice is really, really high up and after, and then after a while, it's cutting us back down normal again, and you're finally talking normal. Okay? Why does helium make your speech high at first? It's because of that same quarter wave resonator stuff. Look at this. Helium speech. Why is it high pitched? Your vocal tract, your throat, from your larynx to your mouth is 17 centimeters. Okay, speed of sound in air, look where I'm highlighting here, is 3.43 meters. So, your throat is going to resonate best with sound waves that are four times as long. Okay, so four times 17 is 68 centimeters. You can see it there grayed out. And what's 68 centimeters? 0.68 meters. So, I'm going to gray this area. Here, frequency equals speed of sound divided by the wavelength. So frequency over 1 is equal to 343 meters per second divided by 0.68. And what do you get when you do that? 500 hertz. So 500 hertz is going to be a natural resonant frequency of your voice. Okay? Because your, your throat is a, five, is, is a quarter wave resonator. Now let's talk helium. Aha! When you're talking helium, sound travels faster. Helium, sound goes way faster. Helium is less dense than air. Remember we said at the beginning, the more dense something is, the slower the speed of sound? Well, helium is less dense than air. So helium, sound goes faster. And helium sound goes 927 meters per second. So when you've inhaled helium from a helium balloon, now the formula is different. It's frequency over 1 equals 927 meters per second divided by 0.68. And when you do the math, look at the frequency. You got 1,362 hertz. Hence, helium makes your voice higher. And it all has to do with the relationship between wavelength, speed of sound, and frequency. 
All right, we are essentially done this section. You'll notice a, a, a few pictures that I drew in here. I mean, here's your outer ear canal. Okay, this is talking about your outer ear canal. It's a quarter wave resonator, two and a half centimeters or one inch in length, a cylinder open at one end, therefore a quarter wave resonator. Okay, and here's your outer ear canal resonance as a quarter wave resonator. And notice that it's not at 3,400 hertz that we said in our notes here. Notice that the resonance is kind of spread. And you know why? It's because your outer ear canal is not made out of glass or metal or steel. It's made out of flesh and bone. And so that resonance is going to be spread out a bit. In the human ear, the peak resonance is actually at 2,700 hertz, and the resonance begins at around 1,500 hertz, and it ends around 4,000 hertz. This is a very important graph, okay? And it's telling you the amount in decibels of resonance and the frequencies of resonance of your outer ear canal. Very important picture because you're going to see the same picture in your anatomy notes when we covered the outer ear. The same thing in the physiology of the outer ear that we covered last week in 120 Anatomy. That's why acoustics and anatomy are so tied together. The principles are involved in both, okay? And here, the purpose of that resonance, we said, is to add decibels to the high-pitched consonants of speech. And here's a person's hearing levels. The X's are the left ear. The O's would be the right ear. And we can see that this person has good hearing in the low frequencies because not many decibels are required for that person to hear. But in the high frequencies, you can tell it takes more decibels. Here would be the decibels in order to just barely hear. So this person, much like the people you will see at your clinics, has a high-pitched treble hearing loss. And now that added resonance offered by the outer ear is no longer enough to make these high-pitched consonants audible anymore. And the person will need hearing aids. Okay? But that's an interesting question, too, because when you plug up an ear with a hearing aid, you've lost that love and feeling because no longer is the outer ear an open ear canal that's closed at one end. Now it's closed at both ends. So you've lost that quarter wave resonance. So that's why hearing aids always have a hole in them called a vent to reduce that kind of a loss. You'll cover that way later. Anyway, we're about done for today. If I go to the PowerPoint slides and show you what I got, okay, here's a picture here of a throat. Okay, this is the human vocal tract. In other words, the other quarter wave resonator from your larynx right here out your mouth. This is your nasal cavity, so we won't worry about that. This is your other quarter wave resonator closed at one end, open at the mouth. So you have two quarter wave resonators, the throat and the outer ear canal. Okay, and they hinge on the principle that they vibrate best with sound waves four times their length. And we talked about the outer ear canal and what it does for, for, for speech. It amplifies the soft, high-frequency consonants. Look at the letter F. Look at how soft it is. It's only 20. Look at the letter S. It's really soft. They need that lift. That's why you have an outer ear shaped the way it is. Because your outer ear, with its bends and folds and the length of the ear canal, make a quarter wave resonator, and basically all of those things put together give you that lovely added resonance of the outer ear. Okay, we be done. I'm going to shut down unit one. Next week, we will begin in acoustics on unit two, the decibel. I'll call it the decibel from hell. Okay, you covered wavelength, speed of sound, frequency. Now it's time to examine another dimension of sound, and that other dimension of sound would be amplitude. So amplitude of sound is we call the decibel. So that's what we'll be covering next week. 
Tuesday at the normal time of 11.30 Central Time, Zoom session number four in, a, in Acoustics 110 will be Unit 2. So print up your notes from Unit 2 next week just before the Zoom session. <sighs> I'm done. I'll see you in just a bit, okay? I'm going to stop recording here. All right. See you later. All right.